gestured widely around us. Trees? I asked, awestruck. She laughed at my tone. No, the Fane realm. She waved widely, wrought according to their will. The greatest of them sewed it from whole cloth, a place where they could do as they desired, and at the end of all their work, each shaper wrought a star to fill their new and empty sky. Valorian smiled at me. Then there were two worlds, two skies, two sets of stars. She held up the smooth stone. But still one moon. And it all round and cozy in the mortal sky. Her smile faded. But one shaper was greater than the rest. For him the making of a star was not enough. He stretched his will across the world and pulled her from her home. Lifting the smooth stone to the sky, Valorian carefully There's closed no one eye. I were... She tilted her head as if trying to fit the curve of the stone into the empty arms of the crescent moon above us. That was the breaking point. The old knowers realized no talk would ever stop the shapers. Her hand dropped back into the water. He stole the moon, and with it came the war. Who was it? I asked. Her mouth curved into a tiny smile. She hooted. Who? Who? Was he of the Fane courts? I prompted gently. Valorian shook her head, amused. No. As I said, so much this damage. was before the Fae. The first and greatest of the Shapers. What was his name? She shook her head. No calling of names here. I will not speak of that one, though he is shut beyond the doors of stone. Before I could ask more questions, Valorian took my hand and nestled the stone between our palms again. They're gonna queue up. They're gonna queue up. This shaper of the dark and changing eye stretched out his hand against the pure black sky. He pulled the moon, but could not make her stay. So now she moves twixt mortal and the fay. She gave me a solemn look, so rare a thing on her fair face. You have your tale, your who and how. There is a final secret now. So all your owlish listening lend. She brought our joined hands back to the surface of the water. This is the part on which you must attend. Valorian's eyes were black in the dim light. The moon has our two worlds beguiled, like parents clutching at a child, pulling at her to and fro, neither willing to let go. She stepped away, and we stood as far apart as we could, the stone gripped in our hands. When she is torn, half in your sky, you see how far apart we lie. I didn't even know that you were going to swing. Valorian reached toward me with her free hand, making futile grasping gestures in the empty water. No matter how we long to kiss, the space between us is not ripe for this. Valorian stepped forward and pressed the stone close to my chest. And when your moon is waxing full, all of fairy feels the pull. She draws us close to you so bright. And now a visit for a night is easier than walking through a door or stepping off a ship that's near the shore. She smiled at me. Twas thus while wandering in the wild you found Valorian, manling child. The thought of an entire world of fey creatures drawn close by the swelling moon was troubling. And this is true of any fey? She shrugged and nodded. Have they the will and know the way? There are a thousand half-cracked doors that lead between my world and yours. How have I never heard of this? It seems it would be hard to miss. Fay dancing on the mortal grass? She laughed. But has not just this come to pass? The world is wide and time is long. But still you say you heard my song before you saw me singing there, brushing moonlight through my hair. I frowned. Still... It seems I should have seen more signs of those who walk between. Valorian shrugged. Most fay are sly and subtle folk, who step as soft as chimney smoke. Some go among your kind and shaden, glamoured as a pack mule laden, or wearing gowns to fit a queen. She gave me a frank look. We know enough to not be seen. She took my hand again. Many of the darker sort would love to use you for their sport. What keeps these from moonlit trespass? Iron, fire, mirror glass. 
Elm and ash and copper knives, solid-hearted farmers' wives who know the rules of games we play and give us bread to keep away. But worst of all, my people dread the portion of our power we shed when we set foot on mortal earth. We are more trouble than we're worth, I admitted, smiling. Valorian reached out and touched a finger to my mouth. While she is full, you may still laugh, but know there is a darker half. She spun away to arm's length, pulling me through the water in a slow spiral. A clever mortal fears the night without a hint of sweet moonlight. She began to draw my hand to her chest, dragging me through the water toward her as she spun. On such a night, each step you take might catch you in the dark moon's wake and pull you all unwitting into fay. She stopped and gave me a grim look, where you will have no choice but stay. Valorian took a step backward in the water, tugging at me. And on such unfamiliar ground, how can a mortal help but drown? I took another step toward her and found nothing beneath my feet. Valorian's hand was suddenly no longer clasping mine, and black water closed over my head. Blind and choking, I began to thrash desperately, trying to find my way back to the surface. After a long, terrifying moment, Valorian's hands caught me and dragged me into the air as if I weighed no more than a kitten. She brought me close to her face, her dark eyes hard and glittering. When she spoke, her voice was clear. I do this so you cannot help but hear. A wise man views a moonless night with fear. Chapter 103 Close Enough to Touch Time passed. Valorian took me dayward to a piece of forest even older and grander than the one that surrounded her twilight glade. There we climbed trees as tall and broad as mountains. In the highest branches, you could feel the vast tree swaying in the wind like a ship on the swelling sea. There, with nothing but the blue sky around us and the slow motion of the tree beneath, Valorian taught me ivy on the oak. I tried to teach Valorian tack, only to discover she already knew it. She beat me handily and played a game so lovely Braden would have wept to look on it. I learned a bit of the fey tongue. A small bit. A scattering. Actually, in the interest of pure honesty, I will admit that I failed miserably in my attempt to learn the fey language. Valorian was a less than patient teacher, and the language bafflingly complex. My failure went beyond mere incompetence to the point where Valorian actually forbade me from attempting to speak it in her presence. Overall, I gained a few phrases and a great dollop of humility. Useful things. Valorian taught me several Feyan songs. They were harder for me to remember than mortal songs, their melodies slippery and twisting. When I tried to play them on my lute, the strings felt strange beneath my fingers, making me fumble and stutter as if I was some country boy who had never held a lute before. I learned their lyrics by rote, without the least inkling what the words might mean. Through it all, we continued to work on my shade. Rather, Valorian worked on it. I asked questions, watched, and tried to avoid feeling like a curious child underfoot in the kitchen. As we grew more comfortable with each other, my questions became more insistent. But how? I asked for the tenth time. Light hasn't any weight, any substance. It behaves like a wave. You shouldn't be able to touch it. Valorian had worked her way up from starlight and was wefting moonlight into the shade. She didn't look up from her work when she replied, So many thoughts, Mike Voth. You know too much to be happy. That sounded uncomfortably like something Elodin would say. I brushed the evasion aside. You shouldn't be able... She nudged me with her elbow, and I saw both her hands were full. Sweet flame, she said. Bring that to me. She nodded to a moonbeam that pierced the trees above and touched the ground beside me. Her voice bore the familiar, subtle tone of command, and without thinking, I grabbed the moonbeam as if it were a hanging vine. For a second, I felt it against my fingers, cool and ephemeral. Startled, I froze, and suddenly it was an ordinary moonbeam again. I passed my hand through it several times to no effect. Smiling, Valorian reached out and took hold of it as if it were the most natural thing in the world. 
She touched my cheek with her free hand, then turned her attention to her lap and worked the strand of moonlight into the folds of shadow. Chapter 104 The Cathay After Felorian helped me discover what I was capable of, I took a more active hand in the creation of my shade. Valorian seemed pleased at my progress, but I was frustrated. There were no rules to follow, no facts to remember. Because of this, my quick wit and trooper's memory were of little use to me, and my progress seemed irritatingly slow. Eventually, I could touch my shade without fear of damaging it and change its shape according to my desire. With some practice, I could turn it from a short cape to a full hooded morning cloak or anything in between. Still, it would be unfair for me to take even a hair of the credit for its creation. Valorian was the one who gathered the shadow, wove it with moon and fire and daylight. My major contribution was the suggestion that it should have numerous little pockets. After we took the shade all the way into daylight, I thought our work was done. My suspicions seemed confirmed when we spent a long stretch of time swimming, singing, and yeah. otherwise enjoying each other's company. Not crazy. But Florian avoided the topic of the shade whenever I brought it up. I didn't mind, as her evasions on the subject were always delightful. Because of this, I had the impression some part of it was left unfinished. One morning, we awoke in an embrace, spent perhaps an hour kissing to arouse our appetites, then fell to our breakfast of fruit and fine white bread with honeycomb and olives. Then, Felorian grew serious and asked me for a piece of iron. Her request surprised me. Some time ago, I had thought to resume a few of my mundane habits. Using the surface of the pool as a mirror, I used my small razor to shave. At first, Felorian had seemed pleased by my smooth cheeks and chin. But when I moved to kiss her, she pushed me to arm's length, snorting as if to clear her nose. She told me I reeked of iron and sent me into the forest, telling me not to return until I got the bitter stink of it from my face. You want me to push. So it was with no small amount of curiosity that I dug a piece of broken iron buckle out of my travel sack. I held it out to her nervously, the way you might hand a child a sharp knife. Why do you need it? I asked trying to appear unconcerned. Felorian said nothing. She held it tightly between her thumb and two forefingers, yeah, as if it were a snake struggling to twist around and bite her. Her mouth made a thin line, and her eyes began to brighten from their customary twilight purple to a deep water blue. Can I help? I asked. She laughed. Not the light chiming laugh I had heard so often, but a wild, fierce laugh. Do you want to help truly? She asked. The hand holding the shard of iron trembled slightly. I nodded, a little frightened. Then go. Her eyes were still changing, brightening to a bluish white. I do not need flame now, or songs, or questions. When I didn't move, she made a shooing motion. Go to the forest. Do not wander far but do not trouble me for the time it takes to love four times. Her voice had changed slightly, too. Though still soft, it had taken on a brittle edge that alarmed me. I was about to protest when she gave me a terrible look that sent me scampering mindlessly for the trees. I wandered aimlessly for a while, trying to regain my composure. This was difficult, as I was baby naked and had been shooed away from the presence of serious magic the way a mother sends a bothersome child away from the cook fire. Still, I knew I wouldn't be welcome back in the clearing for some time, I see what I see. so I pointed my face dayward and set off to explore. I can't say why I wandered so far afield that day. Valorian had warned me to stay close, and I knew it to be good advice. Any of a hundred stories from my childhood told me the danger of wandering in the Fae. Even discounting them, the stories Felorian herself had told should have been enough to keep me close to the safety of her twilight grove. My natural curiosity must take some of the blame, I suppose, but most of it belongs to my bruised pride. Pride and folly, they go together like two tightly grasping hands. I walked for the better part of an hour as the sky above me slowly brightened into full daylight. I found a path of sorts, but saw nothing living aside from the occasional butterfly or leaping squirrel. 
With every step I took, my mood teetered between boredom and anxiety. I was in the Fey, after all. I should be seeing marvelous things. Castles of glass, burning fountains, bloodthirsty tro, barefoot old men eager to give me advice— the trees gave way to a great grassy plain. All the parts of the fay Felurian had shown me had been forested, so this seemed a clear sign I was well outside the bounds of where I ought to be. Still, I continued, enjoying the feel of sunlight on my skin after so long in the dim twilight of Felurian's glade. The trail I followed seemed to be leading to a lone tree standing in the grassy field. I decided I would go as far as that tree, then head back. However, after walking for a long while, I didn't seem to be coming much closer to the tree. At first, I thought this was another oddity of the fay, but as I continued to make my stubborn way along the path, the truth became clear. The tree was simply larger than I had thought, much larger and much farther away. The path did not ultimately lead to the tree. In fact, it curved away from it, avoiding it by more than half a mile. But your plot four and I, got I was considering deal. turning back when a bright flutter of color under the tree's canopy caught my eye. After a brief struggle, That's my curiosity I mean, won out, and I stepped off the path into the long grass. Yeah, it was no type of tree I had ever seen before, and I approached it slowly. It resembled a vast spreading willow with broader leaves of a darker green. Got, the tree had deep, the hanging foliage scattered with pale, powder-blue blossoms. The wind shifted, and as the leaves stirred, I smelled a strange, sweet smell. It was like Wait, smoke and spice and leather and happen? lemon. It was a compelling smell. Did leave? Not in the same way that food smells appealing. It didn't make my mouth water or my stomach growl. Despite this, if I'd seen something sitting on a table that smelled this way, even if it were a lump of stone or a piece of wood, I would have felt compelled to put it in my mouth. Not out of hunger, but from sheer curiosity, much like a child might. As I stepped closer, I was struck with the beauty of the scene. The deep green of the leaves contrasted with the butterflies yeah, yeah. flitting from branch to branch, to sipping from the pale blossoms of the tree. What I had taken at first to be a bed of flowers beneath the tree turned out to be a carpet of butterflies the... almost completely covering the ground. The scene was so breathtaking, I stopped several dozen feet away from the tree's canopy, not wanting to startle them into flight. Many of the butterflies flitting among the flowers were purple and black, or blue and black, like those in Felurian's clearing. Others were a solid, vibrant green, or gray and yellow, or silver and blue. But my eye was caught by a single large red one. Crimson shot through with a faint yeah. tracery of metallic gold. Its wings were bigger than my spread hand, and as I watched, it fluttered deeper into the foliage in search of a fresh flower to light upon. Suddenly, its wings were no longer moving in concert. They tumbled apart and fluttered separately to the ground like falling autumn leaves. It was only after my eyes followed them to the base of the tree that I saw the truth. The ground below was not a resting place for butterflies, it was strewn with lifeless wings. Thousands of them littered the grass beneath the tree's canopy like a blanket of gemstones. The red ones offend my aesthetic, claimed a cool, dry voice from the tree. I took a step back, trying to peer through the thick canopy of hanging leaves. What manners, chided the dry voice. No introduction. Staring? My apology, sir, I said earnestly. Then, remembering the tree's flowers, I amended, Ma'am, but I have never spoken with a tree before and find myself at something of a loss. I dare say you are. I am no tree, no more than is a man a chair. I am the Cathay. You are fortunate to find me. Many would envy your chance. But on the one I Chance? Two, I, I echoed, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was speaking to me from among the branches of the tree. So bad on the a piece of an old story tickled my memory. Have, uh... Some scrap of folklore I'd read while searching for the Chandrian. You're an oracle, I said. 
oracle. How quaint! Do not try to pin me with small names. I am Cathay. I am. I see. I know. Two iridescent blue-black wings fluttered separately where there had been a butterfly before. At、terrible. times, I speak. You were on one. I thought the red ones offended you.、Nice. There are no red ones left. The voice was nonchalant, and the blue ones are ever so slightly sweet. I saw a flicker of movement, and another pair of sapphire wings began spinning slowly to the ground. You're Felurian's new manling, aren't you? I hesitated, but the dry voice continued as if I'd answered. I thought as much. I can smell the iron on you. Just a hint. Still, one has to wonder how she stands it. A pause, a blur, a slight disturbance of a dozen leaves. Two more wings twitched, then fluttered downward. Come now, the voice continued. Now coming from a different part of the tree, though still hidden by the hanging leaves. Surely a curious boy is bound to have a question or two. Come, ask. Your silence much offends me. I was told that you don't get. I hesitated, then said, "I suppose I might have a question or two." Ah. The sound was slow and satisfied. I thought you might. What can you tell me of the Amir? Kikes. <laughs> the Cathay spat an irritated noise. What is this? Why so guarded? Why the games? Solo,、right? Ask me of the Chandrian and have done. I stood, stunned and silent. No. Surprised? Really? Why should you be? Goodness,、oh, boy.、Man. You're like a clear pool. It hurts. I can see ten feet yeah, through you,、cool. and you're barely three feet deep. There was another blur of motion, and two pairs of wings went spinning to the ground. One blue, one purple. I thought I saw a sinuous motion among the branches, but it was hidden by the endless wind-brushed swaying of the tree. The Why the purple one? I asked, simply to have something to say. Pure spite. The cafe said, "I envied its innocence, its lack of care. Besides, too much sweetness cloys me, as does willful ignorance." A pause. You wish to ask me of the Chandrian, do you not? I could do nothing but nod. Not much to say, really. The cafe remarked flippantly. You would do better to call them the Seven, though. Chandrian has so much folklore hanging off it. After all these years, the names used to be interchangeable, but nowadays, if you say Chandrian, people think of ogres and rendlings and skaven. Such silliness. There was a long pause. I stood motionless until I realized the creature was waiting for a response. Tell me more, I said. My voice sounded terribly thin to my own ears. I don't know, like, Why? If you want, if you want, like, I thought I detected a playful like, note in the voice. The venue, it's super like, it's like Because I need to know, I said, trying to force some strength back into my voice. Need? Cathay asked skeptically. Why this sudden need? The masters at the university might know the answers you're looking for, but they wouldn't tell you even if you did ask, which you won't. You're too proud for that, too clever to ask for help, too mindful of your reputation. I tried to speak, but my throat did nothing but make a dry clicking sound. I swallowed and tried again. Please, I need to know. They killed my parents. Are you going to try to kill the Chandrian? The voice sounded fascinated, almost taken aback. Track and kill them all yourself. My word, how will you manage it? Haliax has been alive five thousand years. Five thousand years and not one second sleep. 
Clever to go looking for the Amir, I suppose. Even one proud as you can recognize the need for help. The order might give it to you. Trouble is, they're as hard to find as the seven themselves. Oh dear, oh dear. Whatever is a brave young boy to do? Tell me. I meant to shout it, but it came out pleading. It would be frustrating, I suppose. The cafe continued calmly. The few people who believe in the Chandrian are too afraid to talk. And everyone else will just laugh at you for asking. There was a dramatic sigh that seemed to come from several places in the foliage at once. That's the price you pay for civilization, though. What price? I asked. You can get them. Arrogance, the cafe said. You assume you know everything. You laughed at fairies until you saw one. Small wonder all your civilized neighbors dismissed the Chandrian as well. You'd have to leave your precious corners far behind before you found someone who might take you seriously. You wouldn't have a hope until you made it to the storm wall. There was a pause. Then another pair of purple wings went drifting to the ground. I swallowed against the dryness in my throat, trying to think of what question I could ask to get more information. Not many folk will take your search for the Amir seriously, you realize. The cafe continued calmly. The mayor, however, is quite the extraordinary man. He's already come close to them, though he doesn't realize it. Stick by the mayor, and he will lead you to their door. The cafe gave a thin, dry chuckle. Blood, bracken, and bone, I wish you creatures had the wit to appreciate me. Whatever else you might forget, remember what I just said. Eventually, you'll get the joke. I guarantee. You'll laugh when the time comes. What can you tell me about the Chandrian? I asked. Since you ask so sweetly, Cinder is the one you want. Remember him? White hair, dark eyes. Did things to your mother, you know. Terrible. She held up well, though. Lorian was always a trooper, if you'll pardon the expression. Much better than your father with all his begging and blubbering. My mind flashed pictures of things I had tried to forget for years. My mother, her hair wet with blood, her arms unnaturally twisted, broken at the wrist, the elbow. My father, his belly cut open, had left a trail of blood for twenty feet. He'd crawled to be closer to her. I tried to speak. But my mouth was dry. Oh, he's swung, he's swung. He's one HP. Why? One HP. I managed to croak. Why? The cafe echoed. What a good question. I know so many whys. Why do they do such nasty things to your poor family? Why? Because they wanted to, and because they could, and because they had a reason. Why do they leave you alive? Dude. Why? Because they were sloppy, Sir, and because you because were lucky, I don't know what and because something is. scared them away. What scared them away? I thought numbly. But it was all too much. The memories. The things the voice said. My mouth worked silently, questioning. What? Dude, the cafe me, asked. Bro. Are you looking for a different Why? Are you wondering why I tell you these things? No, I'm rocking single control What freak. good comes of it? Maybe this cinder did me a bad turn once. Maybe it amuses me to set a young pup like you snapping at his heels. Maybe the soft creaking of your tendons as you clench your fists is like a sweet symphony to me. Oh, yes, it is. And you can be sure. Why can't you no, find right this there. cinder? Well, that's an interesting why. You'd think a man with coal-black eyes would make an impression when he stops to buy a drink. How can it be that you haven't managed to catch wind of him in all this time? I shook my head, trying to clear it of the smell of blood and burning hair. The cafe seemed to take it as a signal. 
That's right. I suppose you don't need me to tell you what he looks like. You've seen him just a day or three ago. Realization thundered into me. The leader of the bandits. The graceful man in chainmail. Cinder. He was the one who had spoken to me when I was a child. The man with the terrible smile and the sword like winter ice. Pity he got away, the Cathay continued. Still, you must admit you've had quite a piece of luck. I'd say it was a twice-in-a-lifetime opportunity meeting up with him again. Pity you wasted it. Don't feel bad you didn't recognize him. They have a lot of experience hiding those telltale signs. Not your fault at all. It's been a long time. Years. Besides, you've been busy currying favor, rolling around in the cushions with some pixie sating your base desires. Three green butterflies twitched all at once. Their wings looked like leaves as they spun to the ground. Speaking of desires, what would your Denna think? My, my. Imagine her seeing you here. You and the pixie all tangled up at it like rabbits. He beats her, you know. Her patron. Not all the time, but often. Sometimes in a temper, but mostly it's a game to him. How far can he go before she cries? How far can he push before she tries to leave and he has to lure her back again? It's nothing grotesque, not mind you. No burns. Nothing that will leave a scar. Not yet. Two days ago, he used his walking stick. That was new. Welts the size of your thumb under her clothes. Bruises down to the bone. She's trembling on the floor with blood in her mouth. And you know what she thinks before the black? You. She thinks of you. You thought of her, too, I'm guessing. In between the swimming and strawberries and the rest. The Cathay made a sound like a sigh. Poor girl. She's tied to him so tight. Thinks that's all she's good for. Wouldn't leave him, even if you ask. Which you won't. You. So careful. So scared of startling her away. And well, you should be, too. She's a runner, that one. Now that she's left Severin, how can you hope to find her? It's a shame you left without a word, you know. She was just beginning to trust you before that, before you got angry. Before you ran off, just like every other man in her life, just like every other man. Lusting after her, full of sweet words, then just walking away. Leaving her alone. Good thing she's used to it by now, isn't it? Otherwise, you might have hurt her. Otherwise, you just might have broken that poor girl's heart. What? It was all too much. I turned and ran, pelting madly back the way I had come. Back to the quiet twilight of Felurian's clearing. Away, away, away. And as I ran, I could hear Cathay speaking behind me. Its dry, quiet voice followed me longer than I would have thought possible. Come back. Come back. I've more to say. I've so much more to tell you. Won't you stay? It was hours before I came back to Felurian's clearing. I'm not sure how I found my way. I only remember being surprised at the sight of her pavilion through the trees. The sight of it slowed the mad spinning of my thoughts until I could begin to think again. I went to the pool and took a long, deep drink, splashing water on my face to clear my head and hide the signs of tears. After a moment or two of quiet reflection, I stood and walked to the pavilion. It was only then that I noticed a curious lack of butterflies. There were usually at least a handful flitting around, but now there were none. Felurian was there. 
but the sight of her only unsettled me further. It was the only time I had ever seen her look less than perfectly beautiful. She lay among the cushions, drawn and weary, as if I had been gone for days instead of hours, and she had not eaten or slept all the while. She lifted her head tiredly when she heard me approach. It is done, she said, but when she looked at me, her eyes widened with surprise. I looked down and saw that I was bramble-torn and bloody. I was spattered with mud and grass-stained along my entire left side. I must have fallen during my mindless flight away from the cafe. Wait, it stopped leaving. Florian sat upright. I have no more heels. What has come of you? Is there more heels? No more I brushed absently at a bit of dried blood on my elbow. I might ask the same of you. My voice sounded thick and coarse, as if I'd been shouting. When I looked up, I saw real concern in her eyes. I went walking dayward. I found something in a tree. It called itself a cafe. Valorian went motionless when I spoke its name. The cafe? Did you speak? I nodded. Did you ask of it? But before I could answer, she gave a quiet, despairing cry and rushed to me. She began to run her hands over my body as if searching for wounds. After a minute of this, she took my face in her hands and looked into my eyes as if frightened of what she might find there. Are you well? Her concern brought a faint smile to my lips. I began to assure her that I was fine, and I remembered the things the cafe had said. I remembered the fires and the man with ink-black eyes. I thought of Denna sprawled on the floor with a mouthful of blood. Tears came to my eyes, and I choked. I turned away and shook my head, eyes clenched shut and unable to speak. She stroked the back of my neck and said, All is well. The hurt will go. It has not bit you, and your eyes are clear, so all is well. I pulled away from her enough to look her in the face. My eyes? The things the Cathay says can leave men broken in their heads. But I would see it if it were so. You are still my Kvothe, still my sweet poet. She leaned forward, oddly hesitant, then gave me a gentle kiss on my forehead. It lies to men and drives them mad? She shook her head slowly. The Cathay does not lie. It has the gift of seeing, but it only tells things to hurt men. Only a Dennerling would speak to the Cathay. She touched the side of my neck to soften her words. I nodded, knowing it to be the truth, and I began to cry. Halo Reach theme song, fuck yeah. Chapter 105, Interlude, A Certain Sweetness. Quoth motioned for Chronicler to stop writing. Are you all right, Bast? He gave his student a look of concern. You look like you've swallowed a lump of iron. Bast did look stricken. His face was pale, almost waxy. His normally cheerful expression was aghast. Reshi, he said, his voice as dry as autumn leaves. You never told me you spoke with the Cathay? There's a lot of things I've never told you, Bast, Quoth said flippantly. That's why you find the sordid details of my life so enthralling. Bast gave a sickly smile, shoulders sagging with relief. Where'd the Pathfinder go? You didn't really, then. Talk with it, I mean. It's something you just added to make things a little more colorful. Please, Bast, Both said, obviously offended. My story has quite enough color without my adding to it. Don't lie to me! Bass shouted suddenly, coming halfway out of his seat with the force of it. Don't you lie to me about this! Don't you dare! Bass struck the table with one hand, toppling his mug and sending Chronicler's inkwell skittering across the table. Quick as blinking, Chronicler snatched up the half-covered sheet of paper and pushed his chair back from the table with his feet, saving the sheet from the sudden spray of ink and beer. Bass leaned forward, his face livid as he stabbed a finger at Quoth. I don't care what other shit you spin into gold here. But you don't lie about this, Reshi. Not to me. 
Kroth gestured to where Chronicler sat, holding the pristine sheet of paper in the air with both hands. Bast, he said, this is my chance to tell the full and honest story of my life. Everything is... Bast closed his eyes and pounded the table like a child in the grip of a tantrum. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Bast pointed at Chronicler. I don't give a fiddler's fuck what you tell him, Reshi! He'll write what I say, or I'll eat his heart in the market square. He turned the finger back to the innkeeper and shook it furiously. But you'll tell me the truth, and you'll tell me now! Quoth looked up at his student, the amusement bleeding out of his face. Bast, we both know I'm not above the occasional embellishment. Dude, but wait, this no, story is Mario different. Oh, this yeah. is my chance to get the I'm truth of matters about. recorded. Oh, wait, yeah, it's the truth that. behind the stories. Oh, wait, the dark young man hunched forward in his chair and covered his eyes with oh, one this hand. Quoth looked at him, his face full of concern. Are you all right? I'm moving too much. I'm, I'm doing it. Bast shook his head, still covering his eyes. Bast, Quoth said gently, I mean, your hand is bleeding. He waited a long moment before asking. Bast, what's oh. the matter? That was a bad That's cue. just it! Bast burst out, throwing his arms wide, his voice high and hysterical. I think I finally understand what the matter is! Bast laughed then, but it was loud and strained and choked off into something that sounded like a sob. He looked up at the rafters of the tap room, his eyes bright. He blinked, as if fighting back tears. Quoth leaned forward to lay his hand on the young man's shoulder. Bast, please. It's just that you know so many things, Bast said. You know all sorts of things you're not supposed to. You know about the Baron Talfa. You know about the White Sisters and the Laughing Way. How can you not know about the Cathay? It's... It's a monster! Quoth relaxed visibly. Good lord, Bast, is that all? You had me all in a sweat. I faced down things far worse than... There isn't anything worse than the Cathay! Bast shouted, bringing his clenched fist down on the tabletop again. This time, there was the sharp sound of tearing wood as one of the thick timbers bowed and cracked. Reshi, shut up and listen! Really listen! Bast looked down for a moment choosing his words carefully. You know who the Sith are? Quoth shrugged. They're a faction among the Fey, powerful with good intentions. Bast waved his hands. You don't understand them if you use the term good intentions. But if any of the Fey can be said to work for the good, it's them. Their oldest and most important charge is to keep the Cathay from having any contact with anyone. With anyone! I didn't see any guards, Quoth said, in the tones a man might use to soothe a skittish animal. Bast ran his hands through his hair, leaving it in disarray. I can't for all the salt in me guess how you slipped past them, Reshi. If anyone manages to come in contact with the Cathay, the Sith kill them. They kill them from a half mile off with their long horn bows. Then they leave the body to rot. If a crow so much as lands on the body, they kill it too. Chronicler cleared his throat gently, then spoke up. If what you're saying is true, he asked, why would anyone go to the Cathay? Bast looked for a moment as if he would snap at the scribe, then gave a bitter sigh instead. In all fairness, my people are not known for making good decisions, he said. Every fey girl and boy knows the Cathay's nature, but there's always someone eager to seek it out. Folk go to it for answers or a glimpse of the future, or they hope to come away with a flower. A flower? Quoth asked. Bast gave him another startled look. The Rinna? Not seeing any recognition in the innkeeper's face, he shook his head in dismay. The flowers are a panacea, Reshi. They can heal any illness, cure any poison, mend any wound. Quoth raised his eyebrows at that. Ah, he said, looking down at his folded hands on the tabletop. 
I see. I can understand how that might draw a person in, though they knew better. The innkeeper looked up. I have to admit, I don't see the trouble, he said apologetically. Okay, what's the next game I've seen working? monsters, Bast. The Cathay falls short of that. That was the wrong word for me to use, Reshi, Bast admitted. But I can't think of a better one. If there was a word that meant poisonous and hateful and contagious, I'd use that. Bast drew a deep breath and leaned forward in his chair. Reshi, the Cathay can see the future, not in some vague oracular way. It sees all the future, clearly, perfectly. Everything that can possibly come to pass, branching out endlessly from the current moment. Quoth raised an eyebrow. It can, can it? It can, Bast said gravely. And it is purely, perfectly malicious. This isn't a problem for the most part, as it can't leave the tree. But when someone comes to visit... Quoth's eyes went distant as he nodded to himself. Look at if it knows the future perfectly, he said slowly, you don't remember that then it must know exactly how a person okay. will react to anything it says. Bast nodded. Yeah, remember, well, we and it is nasty, vicious, yeah, Reshi. Both continued in a musing tone. It got, it got that means really, anyone influenced really by the cafe would be like an arrow shot you into the future. And then somebody would portal on your shit an arrow you only hits one forward. person, Reshi. Bast's dark eyes were hollow and hopeless. I'm kind of bored of gaming. Anyone yeah. influenced by the Cathay is like a plague ship sailing for a harbor. I'm going... Bast yeah, pointed yeah, at the half-filled sheet I'm not, I'm not. Chronicler held in his lap. If the Sith knew that existed, they would spare no effort to destroy it. They would kill us for having heard what the Cathay said. Because anything carrying the Cathay's influence away from the tree, Quoth said, looking down at his hands. He sat silently for a long moment, nodding thoughtfully. Oh, so, you can be you so a young man <laughs> seeking his fortune goes to the Cathay and takes away a flower. Flawless. The daughter of the king is deathly ill, and he takes the flower to heal her. They fall in love despite the fact that she's betrothed to the neighboring prince. You could probably turn that into a pickup line. Bast stared at Quoth, watching blankly as he spoke. Yeah, he they attempt a daring moonlight escape, Quoth continued. But he falls from the rooftops, and they're caught. The princess is married against her will, and stabs the neighboring prince on their wedding night. The prince dies. I didn't hear Civil war. Fields burned and salted. Famine. Plague. That's the story of the Fasting's Way War, Bast said faintly. Quoth nodded. It's one of the stories Felurian told. I never understood the part about the flower until now. She never mentioned the Cathay. She wouldn't have, Reshi. It's considered bad luck. He shook his head. No, not bad luck. It's like spitting poison in someone's ear. It simply isn't done. Chronicler recovered some of his composure and slid his chair back toward the table, still holding the sheet carefully. He frowned at the table, broken and streaked with beer and ink. It seems like this creature has quite a reputation, he said, but I find it hard to believe it's quite as dangerous as all that. Bast looked at Chronicler incredulously. Iron and bile, he said, his voice quiet. Do you think I'm a child? Do you think I don't know the difference between a no, campfire story and the truth? You ever it, though. Chronicler made a mollifying gesture with one hand. That's not what I... Without taking his eyes from Chronicler, Bast laid his bloody palm <laughs> flat on the table. The wood groaned and the broken timbers snapped back into place with a sudden crackling sound. Bast lifted his hand then brought it down sharply on the table, and the dark runnels of ink and beer suddenly twisted and shaped themselves into a jet-black crow that burst into flight, circling the tap room once. And then they said that we improved the way the Bast caught it with both hands and tore the bird carelessly in half, casting the pieces into the air where they exploded into great washes of flame the color of blood. It all happened in the space of a single breath. 
Everything you like, know about the Fae could fit inside a thimble, Bast said, looking at the scribe with no expression at all, his voice flat and even. How dare you doubt me? You have no idea who I am. Chronicler sat very still, but he did not look away. I swear it by my tongue and teeth, Bast said crisply. I nah, swear it on the doors of stone. Gonna be I am telling you three thousand times, there is nothing in my world or yours more dangerous than the Cathay. There's no need for that, Bast, Quoth said softly. I believe you. Oh, shit. Bast turned to look at Quoth, then sagged miserably in his chair. I wish you didn't, Reshi. Quoth gave a wry smile. Yeah, they are. So after a person meets the Cathay, all their choices will be the wrong ones. Bast shook his head, his face pale and drawn. Oh, that actually Not wrong, me. Reshi. Catastrophic. Eax spoke to the Cathay before he stole the moon, and that sparked the entire creation war. Lanre spoke to the Cathay before he orchestrated the betrayal of Mir Tereniel, the creation of the Nameless, the Skandine. They can all be traced back to the Cathay. Quoth's expression went blank. Well, that certainly puts me in interesting company, doesn't it? He said dryly. It does more than that, Reshi, Bast said. In our plays, if the Cathay's tree is shown in the distance, in the backdrop, you know the story is going to be the worst kind of tragedy. It's put there so the audience knows what to expect. So they know everything will go terribly wrong in the end. Both looked at Bast for a long moment. Hey, oh, Bast. He said softly to his yeah, student. His smile was gentle and sad. I know what sort of story I'm telling. This is no comedy. Other team. Bast looked up at him with hollow, other hopeless team, eyes. I got, I go but Reshi... No, his mouth moved, trying to find words and failing. The red-haired innkeeper like gestured at the empty tap room. This is the end of the story, Bast. We all play know for that. Quoth's voice was matter-of-fact, as casual as if he were describing yesterday's weather. I have led an interesting life, and this reminiscence has a certain sweetness to it, but... Both drew a deep gimme, breath gimme, gimme. Oh, and let it out gently. Is that guy cheat? I think he's cheating, But this bro. is not a dashing cheating. romance. This is no fable where folk come back Nico from the dead. Dad. It's not a rousing epic meant to stir the blood. No. We all know what kind of story this is. It seemed for a moment that he would continue, but instead... His eyes wandered idly around the empty tap room. His face was calm, without a trace of anger or bitterness. Bass darted a look at Chronicler, but this time there was no fire in it, no anger, no fury or command. Bass's eyes were desperate, pleading. It's not over if you're still here, Chronicler said. It's not a tragedy if you're still alive. Bast nodded eagerly at this, looking back at Quoth. Quoth looked at both of them for a moment, then smiled and chuckled low in his chest. Oh, he said fondly. You're both so young. Chapter 106 Returning After my encounter with the Cathay, it was a long time before I was my right self again. I slept a great deal but only fitfully as I was endlessly set upon by terrible dreams. Some of them were vivid and impossible to forget. These were mostly of my mother, my father, my troop. Worse were the ones where I woke weeping with no memory of what I dreamed, only an aching chest and an emptiness in my head like the bloody gap left by a missing tooth. The first time I awoke like this, Valorian was there, watching me. Her expression was so gentle and worried that I expected her to murmur softly to me and stroke my hair, as Ari had done in my room months ago. But Felurian did nothing of the sort. 
Are you well? she asked. I had no answer for this. I was blurry with memory, confusion, and grief. Not trusting myself to speak without bursting into tears again, I merely shook my head. Philurion bent down and kissed me on the corner of my mouth, looked at me for a long moment, and sat back up. Then she went to the pool and brought me back a drink of water in her cupped hands. Over the following days, Philurion did not press me with questions or try to draw me out. She occasionally tried to tell me stories, but I couldn't focus on them, so they made less sense than ever. Some parts made me weep uncontrollably, though the stories themselves had nothing in them that was sad. Once I woke to find her gone, only to have her return hours later carrying a strange green fruit bigger than my head. She smiled shyly and handed it to me, showing me how to peel off the thin leathery skin to reveal the orange meat inside. Pulpy and tangy sweet, it pulled apart in spiraling segments. We ate these silently until nothing was left but a round, hard, slippery seed. It was dark brown and so big I could not close my hand around it. With a slight flourish, Philorion cracked this open against a rock and showed me that the inside was dry, like a roasted nut. We ate this, too. It tasted dark and peppery, vaguely reminiscent of smoked salmon. Nestled inside that was another seed, white as bone and the size of a marble. It's like a cool this Philorion like gave to me. And then after that, it, it was candy okay. sweet and slightly gummy like a caramel. One time, she left me alone for endless hours, only to return with two brown birds, one carefully cupped in each hand. They were smaller than sparrows with striking leaf-green eyes. She set them down next to where I lay on the cushions, and when she whistled, they began to sing. Not snippets of bird song, they sang an actual song. Four verses with a chorus between. First they sang together, then in a simple harmony. Once I woke and she gave me a drink in a leather cup. It smelled of violets and tasted of nothing at all, but it was clear and warm and clean in my mouth, like I was drinking summer sunlight. Another time she gave me a smooth red stone that was warm in my hand. After several hours, it hatched like an egg, revealing a creature like a tiny squirrel that chittered angrily at me before running away. Once I woke, and she was not nearby. Looking around, I saw her sitting on the edge of the water, arms wrapped around her knees. I could barely hear the gentle song of her sobbing quietly to herself. I slept, and I woke. She gave me a ring made from a leaf, a cluster of golden berries, a flower that opened and closed at the stroking of a finger. And once, when I startled awake with my face wet and my chest aching, she reached out to lay her hand on top of mine. The gesture was so tentative, her expression so anxious, you would think she had never touched a man before. As if she was worried I might break or burn or bite. Her cool hand lay on mine for a moment, gentle as a moth. She squeezed my hand softly, waited then pulled away. It struck me as odd at the time, but I was too clouded with confusion and grief to think clearly. Only now, looking back, do I realize the truth of things. With all the awkwardness of a young lover, she was trying to comfort me, and she didn't have the slightest idea how. Still, all things mend with time. My dreams receded. My appetite returned. I grew clear-headed enough to banter with Philurion a bit. Shortly after that, I recovered enough to flirt. When this happened, her relief was palpable, as if she couldn't relate to a creature that did not want to kiss her. Last came my curiosity, the surest sign I was my own true self again. I never asked you how went your final workings with the shade, I said. Her face lit. It is done. I could see the pride in her eyes. She took my hand and pulled me to the edge of the pavilion. The iron was not an easy thing, but it is done. She started forward, then stopped herself. Can you find it? I took a long, careful look around. Even though she taught me what to look for, it was a long moment before I spotted a subtle depth in the darkness of a nearby tree. I reached out and drew my shade from the concealing shadow. 
Florian skipped to my side, laughing as if I'd just won a game. She caught me around the neck and kissed me with the wildness of a dozen children. She had never let me wear the shade before, and I marveled as she spread it over my naked shoulders. It was nearly weightless and softer than the richest velvet. It felt like wearing a warm breeze, the same breeze that had brushed me in the darkened forest glade where Felorian had taken me to gather the shadows. I thought of going to the forest pool to see how I looked in the water's reflection, but Felorian threw herself onto me. Bearing me to the ground, she landed astride me, my shade spread beneath us like a thick blanket. She gathered the edges of it around us, then kissed my chest, my neck. Her tongue was hot against my skin. This way, she said against my ear. Whenever your shade wraps you, you will think of me. When it touches you, it will seem like my touch. She moved slowly against me, rubbing the length of her naked body along mine. Through all the other women, you will remember Felorian, and you will return. After that, I knew my time in the Fey was drawing to a close. The Cathay's words stuck in my mind like burrs, goading me out into the world. The fact that I had been within a stone's throw of the man who had killed my parents and not realized it left a bitter taste in my mouth that even Felorian's kisses could not erase. And what the Cathay had said of Denna kept playing over and over in my head. Eventually, I awoke and knew the time had come. I rose, put my travel sack in order, and dressed for the first time in ages. The feeling of clothes against my skin felt odd after all this time. How long had I been gone? I brushed my fingers through my beard and shrugged the thought away. Guessing was pointless when I would know the answer soon enough. Turning, I saw Felorian standing in the center of the pavilion, yeah, her room. expression it's sad. Really For a moment, I thought she might protest my leaving, but she did nothing of the sort. Moving to my side, she fastened the shade around my shoulders, reminding me of a mother dressing her child against the cold. Even the butterflies that followed her seemed melancholy. She led me through the forest for hours Just until like we came to a pair of tall gray stones. Weird, like, it's either I'm not pulling down enough she I'm drew up the hood of my shade and bid me close correct. my eyes. Then, she I led me in a brief yet. circle, and I felt a subtle change in the air. When I opened my eyes, I could tell this forest was not the same one I had been walking through a moment before. The strange tension in the air was gone. This was the mortal world. I turned to Felorian. My lady, I said. I have nothing to give you before I go, except your promise to return. Her voice was lily soft, with a whisper of a warning. I smiled. I mean, I have nothing to leave you with, lady, except remembrance. She leaned close. Closing my eyes, I bid her farewell with few words and many kisses. Then I left. I would like to say I did not look back, but that would not be the truth. The sight of her almost broke my heart. She seemed so very small beside the huge gray stones. I almost went back to give her one final kiss, one last goodbye. But I knew if I went back, I would never manage to leave again. Somehow, I kept walking. When I looked back the second time, she was gone. Dude. Chapter 107. Fire. I came to the Pennysworth Inn long after the sun had set. The huge inn's windows swelled with lamplight, and there were a dozen horses tethered outside, champing into their feed bags. The door was open, casting a slant square of light into the dark street. But something was wrong. There was none of the pleasant, rousing clamor that should be coming from a busy inn at night. Not a whisper. Not a word. Anxious, I crept closer. Every fairy tale I'd ever heard was running through my head. Had I been gone years? Decades? Or was it more ordinary trouble? Had there been more bandits than we thought? Had they returned to find their camp destroyed, then come here to make trouble? Yeah, that's what I, I heard. slid I've close heard to a window, time. peered inside, and saw the truth. There well, were the forty or fifty people in the inn. Uh, right they sat at tables and benches and lined up at the bar. 
Every eye was pointed at the hearth. Martin sat there, taking a long drink. I couldn't look away, he continued. I didn't want to. Then Quoth stepped in front of me, blocking the side of her, and for a second, I was free of a spell. I was covered in a sweat so thick and cold, it felt like someone had thrown a bucket of water over me. I tried to pull him back, but he shook me off and ran to her. Martin's expression was lined with regret. How come she didn't get the a dam and the big one, too? Asked a man with a hawkish face sitting nearby on the corner of the hearth. He drummed his fingers on a battered fiddle case. If you'd really seen her, you all would have run off after her. There was a murmur of agreement from the room. Tempe spoke up from a nearby table, his blood-red shirt making him easy to spot. When I was growing, I trained to have control. He held up a hand and made a tight fist to illustrate his point. That's so weird. Hurt, hungry, thirsty, yeah. tired. He shook weak. his fist after each of these no, to show so his so mastery weird. over it. Women. The faintest of smiles touched his face, like once, and he shook his fist again, like but with none of the firmness he had used before. A murmur of laughter ran through the room. I say this. If Quoth did not go, I may. Martin nodded. As for our other friend, Where? he cleared his throat and gestured across the room. Hesper convinced him to stay. There was more laughter at this. After a moment of searching, I spied where Daydan and Hespa sat. Daydan seemed to be fighting down a furious blush. Hespa rested a hand possessively on his leg. She smiled a private, satisfied smile. The next day, we looked for him. Martin said, regaining the room's attention. We followed his trail through the woods. We found his sword half a mile from the pool. No doubt he lost it in his haste to catch her. His cloak hung from a branch not far from there. Martin lifted up the threadbare cloak I had bought from the tinker. It looked like it had been savaged by a mad dog. It was caught on a branch. He must have torn free rather than lose sight of her. He idly fingered the ripped edges. If it had been made of stronger stuff, he might still be with us here tonight. I know my cue when I hear it. I stepped through the doorway and felt everyone turn to look at me. I have found a better cloak since, I said, made by Felurian's own hand. Uh, I mean, there's and I have a story, too. One you will be telling your children's children. I smiled. There was a moment of silence, then an uproar as everyone began to speak at once. My companions stared at me in stunned disbelief. Daydan was the first to recover, and after making his way to where I stood, surprised me with a rough, one-armed embrace. Only then did I notice one of his arms was hanging from his neck in a splint. I gave it a questioning look. Did you run into trouble? I asked, while the room buzzed chaotically around us. Daydan shook his head. Aspa, he said simply. She didn't take too kindly to the thought of me running off after that fairy woman. She sort of convinced me to stay. She broke your arm? I remembered my parting glimpse of Hespa holding him to the ground. The big man looked down at his feet. A bit. She sort of held on to it while I tried to twist away. He gave a slightly sheepish smile. I guess you could say we broke it together. I clapped him on his good shoulder and laughed. That's sweet. Truly touching. I would have continued, but the room had quieted. Everyone was watching us. Watching me. As I looked at the crowd of people, I felt suddenly disoriented. How can I explain... I've already told you, I don't know how much time I spent in the Fae, but it had been a long, long while. I had lived there so long that the strangeness of it had faded. I'd grown comfortable there. Now that I was back in the mortal world, this crowded taproom seemed strange to me. 
I basically cracked How it odd to be indoors rather than under the naked sky. The thick timbered wooden benches and tables looked so primitive and rough. The lamplight seemed unnaturally bright and harsh to my eyes. I'd had no company but Felurian for ages, and the people around me seemed strange by comparison. The whites of their eyes were startling. They smelled like sweat and horses and bitter iron. Their voices were hard and sharp, their postures stiff and awkward. But that only scratches the bare surface of it. I felt out of place in my own skin. It was profoundly irritating to be wearing clothes again, and I wanted nothing more than to be comfortably naked. My boots felt like a prison. On my long walk to the Pennysworth, I'd had to constantly fight the urge to remove them. Looking at the faces around me, I saw a young woman of no more than twenty. She had a sweet face and clear blue eyes. She had a perfect mouth for kissing. I took half a step towards her, fully intending to catch her up in my arms and... I stopped suddenly, just as I began to reach out with one hand to caress the side of her neck, and my head spun with something very close to vertigo. Things were different here. The man sitting beside the woman was obviously her husband. That was important, wasn't it? It seemed a very vague and distant fact. Why wasn't I already kissing this woman? Why wasn't I naked, eating violets and playing music underneath the open sky? Looking around the room again, everything seemed terribly ridiculous. These people sitting on their benches, wearing layers on layers of clothing, eating with knives and forks. It all struck me as so pointless and contrived. It was incredibly funny. It was like they were playing a game and didn't even realize it. It was like a joke I'd never understood before. And so I laughed. It wasn't loud or particularly long. But it was high and wild and full of strange delight. It was no human laugh, and it moved through the crowd like wind among the wheat. Those near enough to hear it shifted in their seats, some looking at me with curiosity, some with fear. Some shivered and refused to meet my eye. Limachik was mid, that's Cap. Adriana Lima was not mid. Did I just kill myself in game, of course?